your Bibles, open it up to Matthew chapter 14, get something to write with, get it out. Guys, thanks for coming. Um, we've had some weird conditions lately. Anybody get afraid that your house was going to be flooded yesterday? They see some hands raised. I've always wanted to live on the lake, and I was really close yesterday, <laughs> really close. My house, I live off Maples Branch. They, uh, they closed Maples Branch both ways, so I couldn't get home. My wife was home by herself. I came to church to do a funeral. I couldn't get home. I was going to have to run the roadblock, and um, if they were going to give me a fine, I was going to have to play the preacher card. I'm coming back from a funeral. My wife is home alone. I'm in a series called Lonely Planet. I don't, I mean, it's, I don't, um, but pray for several of our church people. We know a few that their houses did get a little bit flooded. They've had, they had some issues, um, either some roof issues, some basement issues. We've got a lot, that, that was crazy yesterday, crazy. So at least it wasn't snow because as much rain as we had yesterday, can you imagine if that was 30 degrees or below, that would have been equivalent to what, 45 inches to 60 inches of snow. So then no one would have been at church but us Christians. So, right? <laughs> we had to cancel last night's church. I hated doing that. So thank you for coming. We had a great crowd. You guys look amazing. I was worried a little bit because people do use this as an excuse. And I will say this about the message this week. This is a t the message that some people that maybe are not here really needed to be here, but they used an excuse um, to not be here. So thank you for fighting for being at church, fighting for your faith. It's very, very important. So today we're in a series, uh, we continue a series called Lonely Planet. We're going to talk about the word panic and how we know that loneliness is a trigger today. Anxiety, depression, panic attacks, these are words that were not used in our society. Panic attack was not used in our society when I was a teenager in the 80s. It's interesting where, what we're seeing, the epidemic that is really rampant, um, it's all over the place. Do you realize, think about this to start. I read this study the other day that Barnes & Noble, the bookstore, did a study from August 2017 to August 2018 on trends of book sales and anxiety, books on anxiety rose nationally in the United States of America in one year, 25%. So... I talked to a counselor friend of mine this week, and I, I, I asked him this question. I said, I, I read this stat the other day that it said one in five people today are struggling with an anxiety or a mental disorder. I said, is that true? Does that seem high to you? And he goes, Brent, that's too low. For what we see on a day-to-day -day basis in our counseling centers, um, 50 to 60% of adults today are struggling with this idea of loneliness that triggers anxiety and panic. And, and Peter knew this, and we're going to look in Matthew chapter 14. But before I do that, let's, let's celebrate a few things that are going on. Number one, um, let's celebrate our Sevier County Smokey Barretts who won the district championship next door, which was really cool. <laughs> They also won their quarterfinal game. Celebrate the Smokey Bear boys who also won their district and they're playing this afternoon. So you can come to church, go watch a high school basketball game, and then come back to church. That sounds like East Tennessee for you right there. So pray, um, this, celebrate with us. Brooke, I, I called her Brooke Wilhoyt on Wednesday night. She actually is married with children. Brooke Shelley, next door, was the coach of the year, and her Northview Cougar girls won the district as well. So give it up for Brooke Shelley as well. That's awesome. And uh, give it up for ourselves for being a church. All right, that's great. That's great. That's great. That's great. That's great. I'll say this, and I'll go ahead and, and confess a little bit, confessions of the preacher. Uh, obviously, be careful what a pastor talks about. And then this series, Loneliness. And last week, if you missed last week, I was on location. Um, we did a on-location message in Rhyolite, Nevada. We shot that several weeks ago. And I really th found that place fascinating because a lot of us can feel abandoned. We can, we can feel forsaken. We can feel our ourselves in this wilderness of loneliness. It's, it is becoming um, an epidemic today. People are lonely across the board. Just for people walking out of church, Wednesday night in particular, I had several people, Pastor Pat, my mom had several people walk out and just mention the word, hey, you don't understand how lonely we all feel. I had a man that left the service a while ago, the first service, who has been given only six months to live. He's got terminal cancer. 
and he just cried, and you, you'll kind of you'll kind of feel what I feel in just a minute because I'll use an illustration at the end of this message, and when I use that illustration, it hit home with him because just several weeks ago he had a son that went to the top of, of a mountain um, here real close and found the nearest tree and hung himself and committed suicide, and he felt like he was he was forsaken and his life was just a total wreck. He would equate his life to a wrecking ball. He called himself a wrecking ball, that he would just wreck people around him. We live in perilous, dark, evil times. And so the weather is a, a perfect kind. I, I can't believe um, the hair on the back of my neck stands up because this message was done and, and preached already and been thought through for weeks. And then we have this weather, floods um, come. A lot of us I saw on Facebook, I love Facebook. I mean, Facebook blows up. I and mean, we got pictures of our creeks and our streams. And this is our pool in the backyard. And this is my bathtub. I mean, we, we take pictures of everything. <laughs> But many of us, it was legit. Some of us could not figure out a way to get home. For me, I live on Maple Street. I could not get home. Went down one way. They put police tape. I, I, I told you. And then I went the other way. It was like miles out of the way. And it was worse. And I, and I couldn't. I'm like, what am I, am I going to get a kayak? What do I need to do to get home? Um, I just want to be home. And I felt so out of control. I felt like, wow, what is, this is crazy. So it's interesting, the word panic, and that's the word I'm after today. I want to talk about the word panic for a little bit because many of us, we believe these, I, I will call them lies of loneliness. The enemy would love for us to get our minds into a place to where we feel a lost, we feel alone. You know, the big questions of life, who am I, um, where did I come from, where am I going, and what's my purpose, right? Those are the big questions in life, and the enemy would love for us just to get derailed and think, man, I'm all alone in the world, and no one cares for me and I feel forsaken and I feel abandoned. And if we don't watch it, um, panic sets in. And I'll say this statement. I made this statement down the hall the other day to the church staff and a few of them walked in and goes, that's, that's stupid. What, 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 what are you saying? L listen to my statement. Ready? Giving way to panic has proven helpful in a crisis. Said no one ever, right? You're like, that's the dumbest thing ever. But that is our, that's, our, that's the human, that's human nature. Many of us, if we don't watch it, we give in to panic. Panicked swimmers drowned. Last summer, beautiful day, Douglas Lake. People that don't live around here, they, they come to see Douglas Lake in the summer. They're like, this is beautiful, right? I'm like, come for like eight months of the year. We call it Douglas Dirt. I mean, it's just, it's just, but the lake is beautiful, right? And last summer, my family, um, we were on the lake. It was the 4th of July, perfect Americana day, right? B beautiful breeze. It was a little breezy, not, not like quite today, but the sun was out. And just to think about the perfect day, and here come the rescue boats around the corner and just one cove over from where we spent our day on Douglas Lake last 4th of July, a young 20-something, um, Young, young man, fit, in good shape, not drinking, drowned, just one cove over. And you, you ask yourself, I ask myself, how does that happen? A 20-something, he's fit. Well, Douglas Lake is not a swimming pool. I will not get in that lake without a life jacket. We underestimate the power. If the wind starts whipping offshore, it's very difficult to swim back to your boat. And he panicked. I, I used to whitewater raft. I was that weirdo. When I was rafting, I mean, people did not like to be in my rafting boat because I talk a lot, you might guess, and I have questions, and I'm that guy in the boat right before we go down a big rapid, you know, talking to the guide. So, has anybody ever died on this river? You know, I mean, I'm that guy. They never want to talk to me. But after they'll talk to me, and here's what they'll say. Yes, people have died on this river, if, if they have. And the upper gullies, what I'm talking about in West Virginia. And they're like, yes, they've died. And well, how did they die? All of them say the same thing. They panicked. Lifelines were thrown at them, hit them. But they were panicking. And they never grabbed it. They got sucked underneath the rock. Three days later, they turned the dam off and they extracted a body. Panic sets in. That is our world today. Two years ago, one month ago, the first Thursday of January in 2017, I could have talked to you abstractly about panic and panic attacks, but for the first time in my life, 
I had a panic attack, so much so that I thought I was going to die. Some of you know that story. I'll give you an update as I go along in this message. It's easy to panic. It's easy to feel like life's out of control. And every single time, I've only had it happen full blown that one time. There's been three other times since then that I felt like it was coming on and I've had to course correct and redirect and I'll, I'll explain how I'm getting there in my life. In this season of my life, I'm, I'm actually just seeing myself come out the other side and it's all thanks be to God. But there's so many of us that can raise. How many people in this room have ever had what we would call a panic? panic attack. Can I see your hands? Look around. Every single service. I thought Wednesday night, everybody raised their hand. It's an epidemic today. Why? Society is moving faster. Technology is not helping us build relationships. Technology is distracting us from the relationship that matters. So we have no solitude with God. And most importantly, we walk away from the promises of God. And without the promises of God, I promise you, panic will set in. And we'll think we can do it on our own. And the wind and the waves of loneliness will continue just to pound on us till we want to give up. Panic is all over the place. Just to have a little bit of fun because this message is a little heavy. I like some of these pictures. I thought you would never, ever, 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 ever come home, so I panicked. I love the dog. <laughs> Anybody have a dog that would do that? My dog would do that. My dog would do that. <laughs> By the way, my dog Cash, if we leave him in the house more than six hours and he poops in the house, he looks at us like, you've been gone all day. <laughs> I like this picture. Some of you can relate to this. There was a spider. I panicked, but I think it's gone now. I think it's, I think it's gone now. Some of y'all are looking at me like I'm, I'm crazy. Now I'm panicking because you don't know. The, Peter, you know this story in Matthew chapter 14. It's interesting to me that panic is our national, our, our national, it is a national, but it's a natural inclination. It's a natural thing that we do when we feel like things are out of control around us, that we're in or over our heads, we feel alone, we feel lost, we don't know what to do about it. Well, people are people, and I love this because this is so, there's so much interesting, incredible, just information that can turn into some transformation if we will let it happen in God's Word. So Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 22, you know the story, let's unpack it a little bit. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, the other side of the Sea of Galilee. While he dismissed the crowd, Jesus was speaking, talking to the crowds. He, uh, he dismissed the crowd. Um, the disciples get in the boat. After Jesus dismissed them, listen to this. What, what does he say here? He went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Jesus understood the value of solitude. If you read the Gospels, how many times does Jesus get away by himself? How many times did Jesus say, you know what, I'm going to take a break from Facebook I'm going to turn the TV off and I'm just going to lock in with God. Got away by himself. I mean, we live on a mountain, right? We can go up in the mountains. Later that night, he was there alone and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So there was an offshore breeze. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. That's awesome. When the disciples saw Jesus walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost! Ah! They, they cried. They cried out in fear. How many times do we, we talk about fear in the Bible? We're going to talk about that in a minute. Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage. Don't be afraid. Come on in. The water's great. No, he didn't say that. Lord, if it's you, Peter said, tell me to come to you on the water. Come on, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat. Of course it would be Peter. Walking on the water came toward Jesus, but, big but, when he saw the wind, he was afraid. Beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Classic verse of scripture, a lot we can unpack. Let's just spend some time unpacking it. As long as we know this, I mean, these are epic themes here, and it's so important to remind ourselves of the truth. As long as Peter kept his eyes on Jesus, we know that he made forward progress. But the minute he turned his gaze to the wind and the waves, he began to sink. Peter panicked. 
We often do the same thing. The wind and the waves of loneliness threaten to sink us. So I'm going to show you this picture. This picture is going to stay on the screen the entire message. This is us today. Many of us, we live, and like I said, this is what makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up, especially with what we've gone through the last few days. We live in the storms and the floods and the winds and the rains of loneliness today. It is all out an epidemic. It's across so many fronts for so many reasons. And many of us, if we don't watch it, we are out in the wind and the waves. We are panicking. We are treading water, trying to keep our heads above flow. We're trying our best just to not get beat down. But if we're not fixed on Jesus, and I need you to hear me, young person, old person, it doesn't matter. All of us are in this together here. If we don't fix our eyes on Jesus, if we don't view life through a biblical lens, we're going to try to fight these waves ourselves, and eventually we will go down. We can easily panic and buy into some lies of loneliness. So I'm going to give you some lies, some things that I've thought about, some things we need to think about in this series, Lonely Planet. And this is, I think, what our culture perpetuates. This is what we, we kind of look to. And if we don't watch it, we panic and buy into loneliness, buy these lies of loneliness, and then we're in trouble. Lie number one, loneliness is pure evil. Loneliness is evil. Heightening the waves, think about this wave, heighten, heightening the waves of loneliness is a myth. Here's the myth. Loneliness is a result of something incredibly bad, we should never have to experience loneliness. If we believe that, we're going to use everything we got to fight against it. We're going to have no peace, and this is what we see ourselves today, no joy, no what we would, the Bible would say, delight in the Lord. We will never, though, if we believe into this and we don't lock in on what matters, we'll never find our way out of the water. People use scripture like, hey, Brent, you've, you've preached it week one, Genesis 2.18. God said it wasn't good for man to be alone, and he created a woman, and maybe marriage is the end all for loneliness. Yet we have a lot of us sitting in this room right now that are lonely in our marriages. God ultimately wanted Adam with his free will to choose communion, to choose union with him. And even God himself would say, you know what? It wasn't good that he would be alone. God loves us. He will find a way for us. He will make a way. He ultimately gave us Christ. But yet many of us turn our back on that promise and we start to panic. God yearns for us to have a relationship with him. He has provided Christ for us. But yet for us today, I think more than ever, and this is why this epidemic is rising to like, just levels of craziness is that we just don't buy into that. We don't believe that Jesus Christ is enough. Lie number two, uh, I shouldn't have to be lonely. I shouldn't have to be lonely. I, I said it in a few weeks, and I believe this. These are things I believe. Loneliness is a warning signal that something's missing. That's why God created loneliness. We have the capacity to be lonely, so we will feel that ache and that gnaw, and we will ultimately, hopefully, with the free choice we have, turn to our senses and say, God, I need a relationship with you. Over and over and over and over, the Bible is going to say, fear not, have courage. I'm with you. God is speaking. You're not alone. Fear not. Have courage. I'm with you. You're not alone. Say it with me. Fear not. Have courage. I'm with you. You're not alone. Over and over and over. Do you realize in the King James Version, fear not, take courage. I'm with you. You're not alone. These phrases are mentioned 442 times. The English Standard Version, if you break that down, 685 times. How many times does God have to tell us? I mean, apparently we're pretty stupid because God's going to tell us over and over and over. It's woven throughout Scripture. You don't have to panic. I got it. Hang with me. Be with me. Walk away from the stuff that you think is going to make the difference. Walk toward me and see how that changes your perspective, and I put it this way, without a biblical perspective, 
we'll see loneliness as utterly bad, something to avoid at all cost, and we panic. The voice of panic says this in some lady's life. You know what? I'm home alone tonight. I shouldn't be alone. I know that guy, he's less than ideal, but if I don't marry him, I might never have another chance. Some people say, well, Pastor Brent even spoke it a few weeks ago. Loneliness will ruin your health. And here's what I need to hear and you need to hear. Some people believe this lie. God, if you were really good, if you were like, I mean, God, if you were good, if you were as good as the, the pastor of the songs, if you're really good, then you would never leave me in this lonely situation. But again, just like I read in Deuteronomy a few weeks ago, we saw in Jeremiah, we're going to see in David, we see in Jesus, God says it, it's woven throughout Scripture, Joshua 1.9, be strong and be courageous, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you. Hebrews, New Testament, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. Jesus said, Matthew 28.20, 20, the coolest verse in the Bible, one of them, right? ready? Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. But yet many of us today, and you saw hands raised, so you know what I'm after. You know what we're tackling here. Many of us today, we struggle with panic. Panic is, is a sense of being out of control. And you're, you're, you're not going to go. This is the one time it were, I mean, hopefully multiple times, but this is the one time you're not going to go, preacher, you don't know what you're talking about. I do. I mean, I, I went to the hospital. I thought I was going to die. I, I talk for a living, and I cannot articulate what I was feeling. I just know that, man, something was wrong. So I will give you somebody else's definition of a panic attack. This is interesting. Our heart races. We feel our blood pound. A sense of desperation rises up in our throat. We can almost taste it. Then our mind scrambles to latch on to any way out. At this point, any way will do. And for me, those few times this happened, it's always happened when the sun went down. It always happened in those dark moments of my life when I felt like, man, I'm missing my dad. I, I feel like I'm out of control in life. My life is passing me by. I've got so much going on. Ultimately, I would try to figure all different ways of distraction. I, I've been learning breathing techniques. I've got, my wife's got, I mean, essential oils. We've got scented candles. I mean, I'll throw it all out there. We throw in bath bombs. I mean, I'll try it all. <laughs> Some of you are like, go try CDB or whatever, CBD. I don't know, whatever that's called. <laughs> What's that? Uh, there you go. All right. Well, now we're, thank you. I've tried like everything. Many of us, and here's what I had to get, I had to kind of figure out. Many of us, if we don't watch it, and this could have easily happened to me, and this is what really kind of made me panic more. If we don't watch it, moments like that can turn can turn into rebellion from God. We turn away from God rather than t toward him. We reject God's comfort and turn to whatever escape that seems to help, whether it's TV, Facebook, food, alcohol. We might not want comfort on God's terms. We say thanks, but no thanks. And but if we insist on life on our own terms, we will only be entrenched in our loneliness. And so you might raise an eyebrow. You can debate me. That's okay. I want you to not check your intellect at the door. But what I've learned these last few years is I've looked into God's word and how I'm overcoming, I'm, I'm calming the panic in my life. And I am very stereotypical. I'll say it. I'm a very stereotypical middle-aged guy. I'll be 49 in a few months. My son is going to be graduating high school before I blink my eyes. And I mean, anymore, my wife thinks I'm crazy because I'll listen to like 80s love songs and like, man, it was so good back in the day, wasn't it? I mean, <laughs> is anybody with me? I'm like, oh, I want to just go back to the 80s for three weeks. Just three weeks, just have hair again. And I mean, just, you know, I mean, it's, 
I'm, I know, I know, I know I'm that stereotypical. I feel like life's passing me by. I love my family. I love my church. I love my wife, all those things. But sometimes, you know, maybe the trauma and life and the wind and the waves beat us down. It's so easy, look at me, not to fight. It's so easy not to fight for what's right. It's easy just to turn to everything else, and that's our problem. We're turning to everything else. We can't be alone. We have to turn the TV on. We have to have distractions. We have to have noise over and over and over and over. And we've forgotten the lie that I'm fighting against is this. Ready? Um, Here's a lie. I can fix myself. Many of us think, well, I can fix myself. I can fix the situation. I can fix the circumstances. It might not be just some overnight escape. We might strategize for some radical life change. We got to change it all, change houses and spouses and dogs and churches. I mean, we got to change everything. And we'll find what we're looking for. Here's what I'm learning. I want you to write it down. It won't come on the screen, but this is good. God's blessings often come to me by means of my own activity. You can put that equation in almost, I mean, tithing. You know, Javon and I, we were in the wind and the waves of our finances years ago. I've preached on that, and we had to put Christ in the center of our finances. We were way in over our heads. We got into debt, chasing the American dream like a lot of us do, and we didn't put God first and foremost. We didn't trust him. And you know what? God began to bless us. That's beyond monetary stuff. That's a blessing. That is a trust and a peace and a sense of like, you know what? We can deal with these things as we put him first. You can also do that in your mind, and your heart, your marriage, God's blessing. Blessings come to us by means of our own activity. That's why I like the movie The War Room. Man, I want to, I think I'm going to dress up like a lady and be here. That's going to be awesome. <laughs> be ugly. The bottom line I've learned is I can't fix my loneliness. I haven't been created with the capability of doing that. I might can alter my aloneness. It'll come on the screens, but not my loneliness. Only in the light of truth do I understand what matters. If I believe the lies, loneliness is bad and I shouldn't be lonely and I can fix myself, man, these lies will drive us and we will try to tread water and for a little while and then panic sets in. All of a sudden that relocation, we thought, you know what? I know I'm gonna go talk to godly counsel. I've had people come to my office all the time. Pastor, what do you think about this? Should we move? Should I get a divorce? Should I do this? All to try to figure out a way to get out of the water. And I'm like, no, that's a bad idea. And they do it anyway. That relocation might open up new doors, but it's not going to solve loneliness. Signing on to (laughs) Match.com might result into a relationship, but it's not going to be a guarantee to fix your loneliness. So self-assessment, this is good right here. Self-assessment in the light of the truth, done prayerfully through time in God's word, is the way to begin when it comes to calming the panic in our lives. Married, single, young, old, rich, poor, we might not necessarily fix our loneliness on our own void of God, but you know what? With God's help, we can put it loneliness to use. And here's the real question. Are we willing to understand that when we feel the way we feel, that is a signal that maybe we need to realign. Lies about loneliness are replaced only by the truth about God. That God has not left me to solve the plight on my own. Nothing has been slipped through the cracks. I am not stuck in plan B. No matter what brought me to that place, brought you to that place where we are right now. That that ache and that gnaw we feel could very well be God calling us to the real relationship with him through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Loneliness is not hopelessness. It does not have to defeat us. It can empower us to know Christ more and to make him known. These last two years as I've done some self-assessment, counseling, thought about some things, 
talked to lots of godly people that I would consider um, discounsel in my life. I, I kind of can see really what took place that first Thursday night in 2017. And my dad had died in August, and I was charging ahead, trying to be strong for my mom, my family, the church. But ultimately, I just missed my dad. I felt alone and out of control. When I saw him fall in my house that day and, and I rounded the corner and blood was everywhere and I had to shove him in the chest to get his heart started again and knowing pretty much in his feeble state that I just didn't see a way that he would ever recover and he did not recover. Ten days later, he died. And I really believe in those dark moments when I felt out of control and I felt lost and I felt alone. Ultimately, I go back to, man, my dad was like my biggest encourager. My dad would tell me a thousand times every single day, I love you, I'm proud of you, I love you, I'm proud of you, I love you, I'm proud of you. To, I, I'm embarrassed to say this, that sometimes I would say, Dad, you don't have to say that every day. What I wouldn't give to hear my dad say that one more time. And I really do believe I had to come to grips, and it's taken me a while. You have to fight for it. That God would say, Brent, I'm your heavenly father. I got you, man. Though your earthly father is no longer with you, he, he's okay. He's better than okay. You will see him again. You do not mourn without hope, but I got you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And I just need to run to God's promises, and that's what I do. I found that listening to Scripture, I found that memorizing Scripture, I found that locking in on those things. Have I totally overcome it? No. I believe we're always going to be in a battle, many of us. And our world perpetuates this battle, this wind and the waves mentality that we all seem to feel. You know, Peter, which I think was really cool, began sinking in the wind and the waves because he took his eyes off Jesus. But once that happened and he saw no way out, no rescue, panic began to set in. To Peter's credit, instead of fighting harder to save himself, knowing that he couldn't do that on his own, what did he say? What do we sometimes miss? Lord, save me, Peter said. And then Jesus would ask a question, which I think he asked us all. Oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? Why do you doubt? I'll close with this. I wasn't here last week. I shot that video a few weeks ago on location in Rhyolite. Um, I really felt like it was such an interesting place, that abandoned, forsaken feeling. It's just a different canvas to paint a, a message on. And there was a reason for that. My wife and I are struggling today, um, especially with her mother, and my mother-in-law. People ask about her all the time. Is still alive. And this is what we pray every day, that God would take her home. We pray to God every day, God, please take her home. She's been in the same bed for one year and three months. She doesn't know who she is. She doesn't know who we are. Alzheimer's, dementia is a horrible disease. And so my father-in-law is depressed. My sister-in-laws are unsung heroes. They take care of her, although um, she is still under hospice care, um, that she lives at home. My mother-in-law, she's down to about 85 pounds. Um, she just, zero quality of life. I mean, it's just horrible. But family's family, and Italian families are Italian families, and man, they dig in, and they take care of her, and I almost believe that she's still here today because of the love that lady feels every single day. But my wife feels out of control. Sometimes my wife will have a little bit of panic set in, like, I'm not there for my dad, and I'm not there for my mom. And so we spent some time down there last week, just getting mostly my father-in-law out of the house. He's depressed. He will not leave. He wants to sit in that same chair. He's been in that chair for a year and three months. He does not want to leave his wife's side. And, and it's just it's depressing. It's sad. He's in his mid-70s. So I took it for the team last week. My job as the perfect son-in-law was to get my father-in-law out of the house. They live in Riverview on the other side of Tampa Bay. They used to live in St. Pete, but they moved over to Riverview, and the only reason they did that is my brother-in-law and sister-in-law bought a two-for-one house, the kind of the next generation. There's two houses in one, so my, my mother and father-in-law could move in with them and take care of them, so it's cheaper to do it over in Riverview because no one lives in Riverview. Riverview is nowhere land. So I took Phil back to the old, I took it for the team, and I said, honey, I'll drive him over to the beach. I'll take that for this, I'll do that. It was 84 degrees, not a cloud in the sky, perfectly sunny day, it was raining here. I said, I'll take it for the team, I'll do that, I'll be the son-in-law. 
So we drove down the beach from Indian Rocks all the way to the Don Cesar. We went to the Sea Breeze, one of his favorite restaurants. I took it for the team. I had a grouper sandwich for y'all. You know, I mean, I just, I know it was important. We hung out on the beach. Felt like the odd couple. Phil and I are just chilling on the sand. Actually, Giovanna went with us. We had just we had spent the day together. We were out seven hours. It was great. My son had come down as well over the weekend. He had school, but he came down for Saturday, Sunday. He's into kiteboarding now. My son likes to kiteboard. Don't ask. Um, so we drove from the Don Cesar. We were going to go back to Riverview over the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. I've actually shot videos on that before. And we were on the northbound side watching all these kiteboarders. There's like hundreds of kiteboarders now. That's like thing to do. And so my son's out there, we're watching it. My father-in-law, we're having a great time. We're out in the sun, it's beautiful. Here come the rescue boats, out, out in the channel, Tampa Bay, behind me, um, the bridge is close, and all of a sudden we see fire trucks and police cars start to swing by everybody's heading that way to the Skyway. And, and this kiteboarding dude, kiteboarding dudes are different breeds. They're like surfers and rafting guides. What's up, brah? You know, they're out there. So I'm standing there. I don't know how to kiteboard. I'm not, I'm not, kiteboarding's probably passed me by. I look more like a kite. You know, I'm not the board. Um, he just simply looked at me like nonchalant, nobody goes, oh, they got a jumper. Just like nothing. They got a jumper. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, somebody just jumped off the skyway and committed suicide. Really? He goes, yeah, you see those rescue boats? See all those police? Yeah. Because... I just heard from the radio guy that was one of the kiteboarding guides. They had a radio. They were checking on stuff. Yeah, I just heard there was a jumper, and they're on their way to try to extract the body. I mean, got a jumper. Okay, let's go back to kiteboarding. And I'm like, how does this? Ha how much does this happen? He goes, Brent, man, this happens a lot. I'm like, I didn't see this on the news. He goes, we don't, they don't put it on the news down here much anymore because it just gives people too many ideas. So what would possess you on an 84-degree sunny day at 1.30, 2 o'clock in the afternoon to drive your car to the top of the Sunshine Skyway Bridge, beautiful traffic back and forth, nonchalantly put your car in park, walk around your car, and jump off a 200-foot bridge? If you don't think there's a loneliness epidemic in our world today and everybody's battling the wind and the waves and they just can't seem to find their way out of the water, so trust me, look at me. This ain't no sermon that I'm preaching here that's in abstract land. Okay, that's great. Listen, unless we focus our eyes on Christ, human nature is to fixate on our circumstances. That's why we are in the predicament we are in today. Our culture is sweeping us downstream. There is no time for solitude. There is no time to remember the promises of God, to latch in on God. We do anything and everything else. I'm just asking you to think about it. Where, where are you when it comes to this idea of panic? I've been there, and I'm choosing to fight. I'm going to fight. And I'm coming through the other side because of God's help. You know, my friend said this, Brent, you know, in, in, your, in your line of work, you have two things you can do today because sometimes I moan and complain like Jeremiah. You know, so many people have so many problems and this is so hard and our society is so tough. So finally, one of my pastor friends looked at me and said, okay, Brent, you got two choices. You can quit or you can stay in your rescue boat and keep pulling people as fast as you can out of the water. What are you going to do? So that's when I go back to loneliness. It is not hopelessness. It does not have to defeat us. It can empower us for two very important things, to know Christ more and to make him known. You guys still don't get it. You're the greatest ministers this church will ever have. Get outside the walls and go be the church. Love people. Listen to people. Hug your family. Be kind because people are treading water today and they need somebody to point them to Jesus. And you could be the only Jesus that somebody ever sees. Remember. God, thank you for this opportunity to be here. We need you more in our lives than ever before. Nothing formed against us will stand. God, if you are for us, who can be against us? You tell us over and over and over and over and over. Don't be afraid. Fear not. I am with you. Don't be afraid. Be courageous. Fear not. I am with you. Don't be discouraged. Don't be dismayed. Fear not. I am with you. God, allow us to rest on your promises, to trust in you, to lift 
our eyes up and see you and be just like Peter. Sometimes we get into the wind and the waves. May we just cry out, Lord, save me. Save me from this circumstance. You love me more than I love myself. I'm grateful for that opportunity that I have, that relationship that I need to cultivate and fight for every single day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.